Hello and welcome back to part two of the endocrine system. Hopefully you have a color sheet and something to color with. And I'm going to take little breaks after we discuss a couple glands so you can color it in and connect the labels. So we're going to talk about the hypothalamus and just to kind of remind you some things from AP1. So the hypothalamus is in the diencephalon, so that center part of your brain. It's this little triangular area below the thalamus. And the hypothalamus is that integration center for homeostasis, so an autonomic control center. Through the nuclei in the hypothalamus, it's responsible for things like body temperature, sleep, food intake, thirst but is also connected to the pituitary gland. So it is the link between the nervous system and the endocrine system, our two control systems of the body. I'm gonna make this analogy for you and I hope it helps. It seems to have worked well in the past, but the hypothalamus, think of that area as the captain of your ship, so of the body. The pituitary gland is connected to the hypothalamus through this duct called the infundibulum. Think of the pituitary gland, it's also called the hypophysis, which just means to grow under as the first mate. And so the captain talks to the first mate and the first mate directs the crew on a ship. Just to kind of remind you about the pituitary gland where it sits, if you remember your sphenoid bone, there's that cella turcica. The pituitary gland is about the size of a pea, and it just sits in that little saddle, that little indentation in the sphenoid bone. So like I said, we are in the center of the brain. So as a captain, if you think about it, if you're the captain of a ship, you can do something yourself, or you can tell someone else to do it. So the captain, we're going to find out, makes two neurohormones, which it's going to make in these nuclei, and then send these hormones down these long axons to be stored in the posterior pituitary. And so we're going to talk about those in just a minute. So antidiuretic hormone and oxytocin. Most of the time, though, what a captain's going to do is it is going to command the first mate, in this case, the anterior pituitary gland, and then it's going to be the first mate that talks to the crew. So think about the captain. He's very important. He doesn't want to talk to the lowly crew. So he's only going to talk to that first mate, the pituitary gland. So we have setting up a chain of commands. We have captain hypothalamus, first mate pituitary gland, and then the crew are going to be the other endocrine organs. So the adrenal cortex, the thyroid gland, the gonads. So we're going to look at those. But keep in mind, this is a chain of command. Captain, first mate, crew, and that is never going to change. So throughout the semester, it's always going to be hypothalamus, pituitary gland, crew, and the hypothalamus is never going to talk to the crew directly. It's always going to talk to the crew via that first mate, the pituitary. All right, so the glands that we're talking about first, we're going to talk about the gland. I'll tell you where it is. I'm going to talk about the hormones that it produces, the target, and the effect. And then we're gonna talk about homeostatic imbalances. So what happens when there's too much of this hormone and what happens when there's not enough of this hormone. So that's, that's how we're gonna do this. Okay, so this is for you. Sometimes I give you verbiage slides. I'm gonna go ahead and kind of talk through this. And this is another one that's for you. I just snagged this out of a textbook in case you did not purchase one. This is a good catch-all pretty much to everything I've said, but it's always study from your notes and the Quizlet that I provided for you. So let's look right here. So we are first going to talk about the connection between the hypothalamus and the posterior pituitary. Posterior means back. So anterior front, posterior back. So the connection between the hypothalamus and that posterior pituitary is a neural one. And so neural tissue and the connecting stuff, this is called the infundibulum. So that is one of your lab terms. So the posterior pituitary is going to receive those signals through this neural connection, so it's called the hypothalamic hypophyseal tract. Hypophyseal, that's that fancy name no one really uses for the pituitary gland. So what's going to happen is the hypothalamus is going to make two hormones, antidiuretic hormone and oxytocin. And it does it by different nuclei, so just clusters of neuron cell bodies. 
So ADH comes from the supraoptic nucleus, and that just means it is a group of cell bodies above the optic chiasma. And then this group of secretory cells make up what's called the paraventricular nucleus. So it's by that third ventricle, and it is going to make oxytocin. So these cells are going to make these hormones in the cell body and then transfer them down the length of the axon for those hormones to be stored in the posterior pituitary gland. When the hypothalamus, who's the captain, says so, not because it's Friday, then an action potential will be sent down the length of these axons, so neural stimulus, and then we get release of either antidiuretic hormone or oxytocin. So I said this is an example of neural stimuli causing the release of hormones. The way I remembered it is that the posterior, the back part of the pituitary gland is like a storage shed. Okay, if I put my storage shed where I keep my lawnmower in my front yard, yep, my HOA is going to get pretty pissed off. So think about it. Be tacky to keep your storage shed in the front so that always goes in the back. So hopefully that can help you to remember that it's a posterior pituitary that serves as a storage facility for the hormones made by the hypothalamus. Okay, so hopefully you've seen this picture before. So we're looking at a positive feedback loop from oxytocin. So maybe you saw this in AP1 or something like it. So remember, oxytocin is the main mediator of childbirth. And it is this head of the fetus pushing against the cervix that sends a stimulus to the brain. And now we're going to add this extra layer. This area of the brain is the hypothalamus. So it receives that signal. And then through the hypothalamic hypophyseal tract, we get that action potential. Then we get that release of oxytocin from the posterior pituitary. It travels through the bloodstream. Its target is going to be that smooth muscle of the uterus, which will then cause the muscles to contract. And then we get the baby's head pushing against the cervix. We get another signal sent to the hypothalamus and so on and so on until this baby then exits out the birth canal. So it's involved in uterine contractions of childbirth. It's also involved in that milk letdown and ejection we just talked about. It is also that fun hormone that's involved in smooth muscle contractions during orgasm and is also our human bonding hormone, that tending and befriending. And definitely in the case of childbirth and nursing, you can see why it's a good thing to have just those feelings of love for that offspring that just exited out that orifice that was not that large to begin with and also that just interrupted your sleep. And then we were designed to be socially bonded to one another through sex. Yeah, I said it, your book left that one out. The other hormone that is gonna be made by the hypothalamus stored in the posterior pituitary is ADH, anti-diuretic hormone. Hormonal communication generally begins with a part of the neuroendocrine system receiving sensory information and reacting by issuing a command to the body in the form of a hormone. In this example, dehydration is detected by osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus, which then directs or stimulates the posterior pituitary gland to release antidiuretic hormone, ADH. The next step is to transport the hormone molecules to target cells, this is typically done via the bloodstream. Here, ADH is transported through the bloodstream to the kidneys and blood vessels. When hormone molecules reach target cells, they will bind to matching receptors on those cells, and the hormone receptor complexes will trigger changes in the target cells. This causes the kidneys to reduce the urine volume output, thereby increasing water retention and countering dehydration. In blood vessels, vasoconstriction is increased, leading to higher blood pressure and thus countering the blood pressure drop caused by dehydration. So let's go ahead and look at antidiuretic hormone. So if you take that name apart, anti means to be against something. Diuresis, so dia, think diameter, flow through, uresis, urination. So antidiuretic hormone is against urination. So how this works is that you have osmoreceptors. So think osmosis, 
they're going to detect increased osmotic pressure. Basically, they can detect when the body becomes dehydrated, if you want to think about it more salty because of the loss of water. Also, which we're going to add in unit two, you also have blood pressure receptors in your aorta, and we'll learn about the carotid artery. They can also detect when there's a drop in blood pressure. So either when someone is dehydrated, and usually when we lose fluid volume, we also have, drop, have a drop in blood pressure. That is going to cue the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is gonna respond by sending an action potential down the infundibulum to that posterior pituitary. The posterior pituitary will then release antidiuretic hormone. The effect it's going to have on your kidneys, because it's your kidney's job to filter blood and make urine, is it basically tells the kidneys, hey, we're dehydrated, reabsorb more water, therefore have a low urine output. And you know this, you've all been outside in Texas, it's hot, we sweat a lot. If you don't drink enough fluids, you could probably go all day without urinating. The other effect, the other target is gonna be on the blood vessels. The other name for antidiuretic hormone is vasopressin. Vaso for blood vessel and pressin, you think to press on or to constrict. By causing vasoconstriction, so the lumen of these blood vessels to get smaller, we get an increase in blood pressure. So from antidiuretic hormone, we get increased blood volume and increased blood pressure. We also said that the hypothalamus is our thirst center. And so what it's also going to do, it releases antidiuretic hormone, that is it's also going to stimulate thirst because if we obey our thirst, we're gonna seek fluids and then that will also restore our blood volume. So antidiuretic hormone, we are not gonna pee. We are gonna increase our blood volume by taking in more fluids because we're now thirsty. We're also gonna increase in blood pressure because of that vasoconstriction. Antidiuretic hormone is inhibited by alcohol. Not knowing, I can't even see you, don't even know how old you are, but let's assume you're all 21 and older. Perhaps you've noticed when you go out drinking alcohol that, oh, you have to urinate quite frequently. And perhaps you've noticed when you wake up the next day, you're a little dehydrated. And that's because alcohol inhibits antidiuretic hormone. Antidiuretic hormone is also released in a diurnal pattern, meaning our day-night cycles, there is more antidiuretic hormone released at night than during the day. And this is so we can get a good solid, yeah, you know, that's six hours, let's say. So we don't have to constantly get up to use the bathroom. So now we're gonna talk about imbalances to antidiuretic hormone. So here's a nice picture. This is showing you a nephron. It is the filter units of the kidneys. You're going to be seeing this again when we do urinary. But remember the target for antidiuretic hormone, one of them is the kidneys. And so it tells the kidneys to reabsorb water and secrete a low volume of concentrated urine. So it causes fluid retention. So if someone has what's called syndrome of inappropriate, just love that word, inappropriate ADH secretion or ADH release, that means they are gonna have a retention of fluids. Retention of fluids, okay, you can, get, you can get swelling, but there's one place that you cannot afford high volume, and that is gonna be in your central nervous system. So yes, I pulled this picture, I'm pretty sure it's from a really old Star Trek, like I'm, I don't even know, like before me even, but kind of gave this to you so you could kind of remember what happened. If there's too much fluid retention in the brain, the brain case cannot swell. And so that's gonna compress the delicate nervous tissue of the brain. So first you're gonna have headache, then you get disorientation, and if this is not treated, it can also lead to coma and to death. So the treatment of syn syndrome of inappropriate ADH release is gonna be fluid restriction and strict monitoring of blood sodium levels because water and salt are tied together. So too much ADH, yep, that's what you get. You will have uh, very little urine output, too much fluid retention. So now let's go the other way. So let's say someone isn't releasing antidiuretic hormones. So now they're totally for diuresis. So this means someone is just continually secreting high volumes of dilute urine. 
So the term for this is diabetes insipidus. All right, let's take this apart. So dia means through. So once again, we have a through flow. This has to do with urination. That word insipidus, um, in this case, means tasteless. So back in the day, before urine analysis, a doctor would actually taste the urine. Diabetes mellitus is the type of diabetes that you hear of more frequently because mellitus means honey. And so they would taste the urine. If it was sweet, that meant someone had diabetes. If they tasted it and they couldn't detect any other sort of taste, it tastes like water, then it was called diabetes insipidus. And so ADH deficiency, usually due to the hypothalamus or the posterior pituitary damage. Remember, we've got a chain of command, so either one. So you get a loss of fluid, so a person must keep well hydrated. This is not as serious as sin of inappropriate ADH release. I put a little star here. It's not a good thing to have, but the premise is if someone has diabetes insipidus, yes, they're going to have to go pee really bad all the time. They're often going to be super thirsty. But the idea is if they're conscious and they obey their thirst and they have access to water, that they will be okay. They're not going to experience that brain swelling, headache, confusion, coma, and death associated with syndrome of inappropriate ADA relief. All right, so that was the posterior pituitary. So now let's talk about the anterior pituitary. So the anterior pituitary is going to be glandular tissue. And so its other name is adenohypophysis. Adeno means gland. So it is going to receive its orders from the hypothalamus, not through a neural connection, but through a vascular connection. So it's called the hypophyseal portal system. It is going to make and release its own hormones in response to signals from the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus talks to that first mate, the anterior pituitary, through hormonal stimulus, and so it releases either hypothalamic releasing hormones, which says, hey, pituitary gland, get this crew going, or hypothalamic inhibitory hormones, which means stop something. So either we have releasing hormones, which means go, or inhibiting hormones, which means stop. All of these, because they are causing the release of other hormones, are called tropic hormones or tropins. So you are usually are gonna see tropic or tropin in the name, and that term means to move or to change. Once again, I don't know what textbook you're looking at, but they make a big deal about the portal system between the two. We haven't discussed cardiovascular yet, we are gonna get there, but blood flow leaving the heart is arteries, Smaller arteries are called arterioles. Capillaries are the smallest blood vessels, and these are the exchange vessels. So things leave the capillaries and go into the tissue fluid. Things from the tissue fluid can go into the bloodstream to be transported. And then making its way back to the heart are the venules and the veins. When we hear about a portal system or a portal vein, it is going to be a vein between two capillary beds. So we have arteries, arterioles, capillaries, portal vein, capillaries, venules, veins. And so this is what's occurring in that uh, hypophyseal portal system. I don't care too much that you know that. I think one textbook calls this the first plexus, the secondary plexus. The purpose behind it is, though, if the hypothalamus is secreting trophic hormones, we really don't, it doesn't need to go to the whole body. We really want it just to go directly to that anterior pituitary. And so that's the purpose of that portal vein. So faster delivery of those tropic hormones, those orders coming from the captain, the hypothalamus, to that first mate, the anterior pituitary. And so the hypothalamus is going to communicate with that anterior pituitary through releasing hormones. And they have cute little names like thyrotropin releasing hormone. So it's going to get the thyroid gland going, prolactin releasing hormone, hey, pituitary release prolactin, gonadotropin releasing hormone, get the gonads going. So you kind of get the idea. The other ones are going to be inhibiting hormones. So prolactin inhibiting hormone is going to say, hey, pituitary gland, don't release prolactin. Or growth hormone inhibiting hormone, hey, don't release growth hormone. All of these secretions, of course, are going to be controlled through negative feedback. The deed has been done and the message is no longer necessary because as long as the crew does their job, then those tropic hormones are not needed. 
Okay, so that hormonal stimulus. So I gave you the mnemonic flat peg. That's how I remembered it. So there's four of the six hormones made by the anterior pituitary that are just orders for crew members, such as tropic hormones. So F stands for follicle stimulating hormone. L stands for luteinizing hormone. So FSH and LH, those are gonna be tropic hormones for the gonads. So the testes or the ovaries. So follicle stimulating hormone in males causes sperm production. Females, it causes production of the ova, the eggs. Luteinizing hormone causes production of male hormones in the testes, so particularly testosterone. And then female hormones in the ovaries, so estrogen, progesterone. And that's kind of all you need to know for this unit as far as that goes, because we are going to talk at length about those in unit five. A stands for ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone. And so this is going to be a hormone that is going to tell the adrenal cortex to move, to do its job. T is going to stand for thyroid stimulating hormone. We just watched that YouTube. And so this is going to be a hormone that says, hey, thyroid gland, do your job, make thyroid hormones. So the first four are going to be tropic hormones. The other two, so PG, so flat peg, if you want to remember it that way. Prolactin, we've mentioned, is for lactation. And so prolactin is going to cause milk production after a woman has delivered a baby. And then the other one is growth hormone. So that's where the G comes from. So we're going to talk about those two. And then we're going to talk about the thyroid gland and the adrenal gland and how that works. So let's talk about growth hormone first. So growth hormone, it's made by the anterior pituitary, released by the anterior pituitary. Things that are going to stimulate it are going to be growth hormone releasing hormone, of course, from the hypothalamus. Um, also, as a person ages, they have less. We'll look at that in a second. Also, time of day. Um, nutrient levels in the blood when they're high. So high amino acids can cause a release of growth hormone. Also, stress and exercise. But we're going to get growth hormone releasing hormone from the hypothalamus. Then we, that message is going to be received by that anterior pituitary. And then we are going to get the release of growth hormone. And so the targets, the overall thing that's going to happen, growth hormone, just if you were in class with me, I go, what do you think it's going to do? Hopefully you're going, hmm, this is me, something to do with growth. Hey, you are so smart, right? It is going to cause protein synthesis, cell division and differentiation, particularly in muscle, cartilage, and bone. So yes, we're going to get growth. And that kind of makes sense. It has this effect on the liver. So there's growth hormone that does this. The liver then is going to be um, stimulated to produce insulin-like growth factors one and two. Growth hormone and insulin-like growth factors have the same effect. So big thing, bone and muscles, we are going to get increased amino acid uptake. Remember that's so they can build proteins. So we get protein synthesis, we get mitosis, cellular division, and differentiation. So we're going to get growth. The other thing, since we have this little building project going on, we need to fuel that somehow. And so we're going to get increased nutrients in the bloodstream because we're building. So we're going to get glucose, we're going to get glycerol and fatty acids. So we are going to get all these things. So glycogenolysis, the splitting of glycogen, so increased glucose, what's called gluconeogenesis. So the formation of glucose from non-carbohydrate sources. And we are not going to be storing because we we're trying to build. Increased lipolysis, we're going to break down fat, and we're not going to store fat. I don't know if you're a sports fan or not, but Peyton Manning was accused of taking growth hormone as an enhancement. So it is abused in sports, and it's marketed as the fountain of youth because it causes muscle development and the burning of fat. And who wouldn't like some lean muscle mass? So let's look at growth hormone in response to age. And this kind of makes sense. I could ask you, hey, when did you grow the most? And you would say, oh, I grew the most in childhood and adolescence. You'd be spot on. Yes, it's going to peak in childhood and adolescence, and then it's going to decline with age. Even when someone is older, though, they'll still make some growth hormone. Once again, it's released uh, in stress, exercise, and high protein. 
I don't think stress, just like, oh, I'm stressed out, think uh, fever, injury. There's other types of, of stressors, so think physical stressors. Other thing, too, is that our growth hormone is going to fluctuate based on diurnal cycle, so time of day. And so it's going to peak during our early sleep, or if someone's sleeping, and then it's usually low throughout the day. And uh, so you think about it, that kind of makes sense. So we do our growing at night. Uh, one of my children, I actually have three kids. They are 26, 25, and 15. Yes, I did have that pause. I did have to do the math in my head. That's how old they are. I swear one of my kids put them to bed in their cute little onesie. When they woke up, they had grown and it was really hard to get it off of them. So growing occurs at night. So let's look at some imbalances of growth hormone. The other name for growth hormone is somatotropin. So soma means body and tropin means to move or to change. So it's another way you can remember that. If someone has too much growth hormone, then they have what's called gigantism. So once again, they are growing because the target is predominantly going to be the skeletal system and the muscular system. So you have abnormally large stature. This also comes though with negative effects of very large internal organs and usually a reduced life expectancy. Too little growth hormone causes pituitary dwarfism or it's also called growth hormone deficiency. So very small stature, but perfectly proportioned. So same adult proportions. There's another type of dwarfism called achondroplasia. And that is when you have an adult size head, neck, and trunk, but very short appendages. Down here, if you look at this picture, there is an age progression of a woman. This woman has acromegaly. So acro means extremities and mega means large. And so this is when there is over secretion of growth hormone after the epiphyseal plates have closed. So after someone's growth plates have closed, they cannot grow in stature anymore. They're done growing. But this causes that increase in the internal organs, and particularly you get an enlargement of the hands and the feet. You can also see some structural, um, some thickening of the bones, because bones can still apositionally grow in the face. You can particularly see that there. But too much during growth, gigantism, too little, pituitary dwarfism or growth hormone deficiency, and then bad timing, too much growth hormone after the epiphyseal plates have closed, so in adulthood, causes acromegaly. Okay, so let's start our coloring. You can do it two ways. You can just color code your label or you can connect it like I did. So this triangular shaped area right here is the hypothalamus. It is the integration center for homeostasis. It controls hunger, thirst, water balance, body temperature, and sleep. It is the link between the nervous system and the endocrine system. It releases tropic releasing hormones or inhibiting hormones and communicates with the anterior pituitary. It also makes two hormones, antidiuretic hormone and oxytocin, which it stores in the posterior pituitary. Antidiuretic hormone, its other name is vasopressin. It is going to cause an increase in water retention and an increase in blood pressure. So less urine output. Too much is syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, so hypersecretion. Too little is called diabetes insipidus. Oxytocin causes uterine contractions, milk letdown, human bonding hormone, and the pleasurable smooth muscle contractions of orgasm. So this is the posterior, so this is the back, this is the front, this is the anterior. I'm pretty sure you can see his nose right here, so you realize that this is the front, but this right here is that optic chiasma, so that's a good landmark for you. So posterior pituitary, remember that is actually just a storage shed. It releases antidiuretic hormone and oxytocin through neural connection through that infundibulum with the hypothalamus. So the front, the anterior pituitary, come on over here. And so I said four of the six hormones, FLAT, the follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, 
adrenocorticotropic hormone and thyroid stimulating hormone. Those are all tropic hormones. These are just orders for the crew. So follicle stimulating hormone causes egg and sperm production. Luteinizing hormone causes sex hormone production. So testosterone in males, estrogen, progesterone in females. So these are gonadotropins. They tell the gonads to get moving. Adrenocorticotropic hormone specifically talks to the adrenal cortex and tells it to get moving. Thyroid stimulating hormone specifically talks to the thyroid gland and tells it to get moving. Two hormones that are made by the anterior pituitary are prolactin, which causes milk production in a woman after she delivers, and then growth hormone, which its targets particularly are going to be skeletal, so bones and cartilage, and also muscle. Our homeostatic imbalances, pituitary dwarfism, so hyposecretion as a child, gigantism, hypersecretion, so too much as a child, and then acromegaly is when there's too much secretion after someone is an adult. So those epiphyseal plates are closed. All right, so let's go to our next gland, which is the thyroid gland. It is located in the anterior neck. So just inferior to this right here, which is called the thyroid cartilage. The middle ridge right here is what forms the Adam's apple in a male. So just below that, the thyroid gland is a butterfly-shaped gland. So it has a right lobe and a left lobe, so anatomical right, anatomical left. It is connected by a bridge called the isthmus. It has a very rich blood supply, so it looks kind of reddish. And if we look at it, microscopically, it is predominantly made up of thyroid follicles. So this whole thing is a follicle and you have uh, follicle cells or follicular cells that their job is to make thyroid hormone, which is going to be connected to a protein, which is going to make what's called colloid. So this clear pink area that's colloid. And so that's where the thyroid hormone is. And then we have these cells that are kind of in between the follicles, which are called parafollicular cells or C cells. They are going to be making calcitonin. So it is the largest pure endocrine gland, meaning it doesn't have another function. It is the body's major metabolic hormone. It affects almost all tissues. It makes two hormones. We're just going to collectively call them thyroid hormone because most of the time uh, that's kind of the way it's referred to, even though there's something called T4 and T3. So T4 is thyroxine or tetraiodothyronine. Yeah, this is produced in higher concentration to T3. So T3 is triiodothyronine. Both of these hormones have iodine in them. We'll talk about that in a minute. Even though these are modified amino acids, so they are modified tyrosine, they are going to be lipid soluble, which means that the majority of the thyroid hormones in the bloodstream are going to be attached to a carrier. And there's an extra credit option for you to do a case study. I highly recommend that you look at it. And always I tell students, take the, take the free points. But when someone comes in with a suspected thyroid imbalance, they are going to measure free T4 levels in the blood. Just kind of tuck that one away if you're going to do that assignment. The big things that I want you to know, the effect of thyroid hormone is it's going to increase basal metabolic rate, so BMR. This is the amount of energy a person uses when at rest. So how does your body use sugar? The other thing that it does because it sets this basal metabolic rate it also is responsible for heat production, or what's called the calorigenic effect. It is critical for normal skeletal and nervous system development. Now, there is a permissiveness to it. In order for growth hormone to act, you have to have thyroid hormone present. And so this is showing you that chain of command. We've got the hypothalamus, the so thyroid tropin-releasing hormone. II captain says the anterior pituitary. It releases thyroid-stimulating hormone. The thyroid hormone says I, I first mate, and then it's going to release T3 and T4, which will then have negative feedback. So it's going to turn off thyroid stimulating hormone. That makes sense because it did its job. And then negative feedback on the hypothalamus so we don't get TRH release as well. So just 
kind of makes sense. Okay, so big, big messy diagram, but I liked it. It's got some good information in it. It's got tiny writing, so I do apologize for that. So the hypothalamus is going to stimulate this production from the thyroid gland through the anterior pituitary. And it does it when there's cold weather because this is part of that calorogenic effect, so to create heat. Uh, when a woman is pregnant, she's gonna need more energy. Um, also high altitude and low blood glucose levels are all gonna stimulate and kick off that chain of command. So we get TRH goes to the anterior pituitary, TSH, then its target is the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland is then going to make thyroid hormones, both T3, T4, bound by a carrier protein. That carrier protein is called thyroglobulin. Okay, so we're going to get this increase in basal metabolic rate. So that means there's going to be a higher usage of sugar. And how thyroid hormone does that, it's going to increase the amount of sodium potassium pumps on neurons. Which sodium potassium pumps are just constantly uh, three sodiums out two potassiums in, it takes ATP. So we're gonna increase oxygen utilization. Also, we're going to increase the amount of glucose in the blood. And so we're gonna go through glycogenolysis, so break down our sugar storehouses. We're gonna make more glucose from non-carbohydrate sources, which is gluconeogenesis. We're also gonna get increased lipolysis, so we're gonna be burning fat. Also has an effect, um, we're gonna increase our oxygenation because we need more ATP, so that kind of makes sense. And then it also has an effect on heart rate, heart contractility, and blood pressure. So it's gonna increase all of these things. And then we're gonna get negative feedback, of course. If we make thyroid hormone, that means we don't need to hear from the first mate, and we don't need to hear from the hypothalamus because the deed has been done. All right, so there's a couple things about the thyroid gland I'd like you to remember. The thyroid gland is the only organ to use iodine, so that makes it unique, and is the only one that's going to store about three months worth of thyroid hormones, and it does it in those thyroid follicles. All of the other endocrine glands, they are going to sort of make as they go. They do not store months worth of hormones, and so that makes the thyroid gland unique. Other things that are very unique is what can happen is called a goiter. So this is a goiter, goiter one, goiter two. And so it's just an enlarged thyroid gland. It doesn't say anything about the cause. Usually though, it's gonna be caused by an iodine deficiency. So this is showing you uh, T3, so you have the one, two, three iodines, and then thyroxine is T4, so you have one, two, three, four iodines. And once again, it's the only hormones that use iodine. So if there's not enough iodine in the diet, what's gonna happen is the follicle cells are gonna go, they're gonna build it up until the point of adding iodine and they're gonna store it in this colloid. So they're gonna be stimulated to make thyroid hormone, but they won't be able to finish it. So this just sort of stockpiles and then you get the swelling or the enlargement of the thyroid gland. You can, so someone that has an iodine deficiency is gonna have hypothyroidism. You can also get overproduction of thyroid hormone, so hyperthyroidism. So as long as TSH levels are really, really high, you can also get overproduction, which can also cause a goiter. But usually when you see a goiter, it's because of iodine deficiency and hypothyroidism. So this problem with uh, iodine, so iodine is going to be gained through consuming foods, and usually a lot of times it's gonna come from vegetables that are going to have gotten it from the soil. And so there are areas that have iodine deficiencies in drinking water and in the soil. And so this used to be called the goiter belt. So pre-1920s, 26 to 70% of children had a goiter. And so, you know, our good old FDA and our government said, well, we can't have our people walk around with goiters. That's just so unattractive. And so then we started uh, supplementing table salt with iodine. And so that kind of cured that problem. You don't often see goiters anymore, at least in our part of the world. Um, it's still a significant health issue. So worldwide, um, you can see iodine deficiencies 
wherever you see the purple or the dark purple throughout the world. So there's still places in the world you can go to and goiters are not that uncommon. So looking at homeostatic imbalances, so hyperthyroidism, so hyper always means above, so high blood levels of thyroid hormone. So once again, the major thing that's gonna happen, we're gonna increase metabolic rate. So the body is going to be consuming more energy and oxygen. So what you can happen, you're gonna have a weight loss. Also, there's that calorigenic effect, so that generation of heat. So a person is going to uh, feel hot often, sweating, hyperactivity, and increased heart rate. So this is um, a woman, she's in all kinds of textbooks. I still use the picture. So what can happen, the most common cause is called Graves' disease. And so that is an autoimmune disorder. So auto means self, immune system. That means the immune system is attacking self. In this case, the immune system is making antibodies that are actually binding to the receptors for thyroid stimulating hormone. That binding those antibodies is gonna end up in ultimate destruction of the thyroid gland, but at first those antibodies binding are stimulating those follicle cells to make more thyroid hormone and release more thyroid hormone. You get what's called an exophthalmos goiter. So usually you have the goiter and you also have protrusion of the eyeball. And so this is an exophthalmos is that protrusion of the eyeball, and then when you see that with the goiter, except almost goiter, so it just kind of goes together. Treatment is gonna be removal of the thyroid gland, and then whenever that occurs, then those hormones need to be replaced. So now let's look at the other side. So now hypothyroidism. So now we have someone with a low metabolic rate, and they're gonna feel chilled. So they will be cold instead of hot. Often you're going to see weight gain, even though someone has a decreased appetite, their basal metabolic rate is now lower. Reduced libido, that's the desire to have sex. In females, it's going to cause menstrual irregularities. There's also permissiveness with reproduction and thyroid hormone. Someone's going to feel tired, so lethargy, and also a reduced mental activity. This is not permanent delays. Once someone has their thyroid hormones replenished, they'll no longer feel the sluggishness. Most hormonal imbalances occur in women. This is five times more common in women than in men. The most common cause is once again an autoimmune disease. This is called Hashimoto's. It's the most common cause in the U.S. Um, in this case, the antibodies are actually attacking the thyroid gland instead of stimulating it. Throughout the world is also caused by iodine deficiency. The term mixed edema is that term for hypothyroidism that is untreated regardless of the cause. And so that word you see edema in it is swelling. Mixed means mucose swelling. And so you just sort of get this puffy, rounded, skin thickening appearance. So mixed edema. And so treatment, like I said, is going to be a replacement therapy even though this is a modified amino acid, they are lipophilic, so um, lipid soluble. So that drug can be taken orally. It will not be digested in the stomach. If it is due to an iodine deficiency, then just restoring the iodine in the diet will control that or restore thyroid function. Another form of hypothyroidism can happen uh, neonatal, so newborns or in young children if it's not corrected. And so this is that permissiveness. You get a short, stocky body. You'll also get developmental delays. The not so nice name for it is cretinism. And that's just because of the thickening tongue and just the overall appearance. So it's not really the nice name for it. A kinder name is congenital hypothyroidism or neonatal hypothyroidism. Usually, uh, it can be due to an iodine deficiency of the mother. If this is not corrected, however, there will be also developmental delays that they will be permanent. All right, so we talked about the thyroid hormone. Um, the thyroid gland also secretes calcitonin. And so this is going to be through those parafollicular cells, so the cells alongside the follicles, so not the follicle cells, 
these little clusters of cells in between the follicles. And so they make calcitonin, which decreases blood calcium levels. And so this is going to be through that humoral stimulus. When blood calcium levels are high, there's going to be a release of calcitonin. I'd be super honest with you, this one really doesn't, isn't a big player in adults. Um, there has been manufactured calcitonin that can be used to treat things like Paget's disease to help increase those calcium levels, so bone diseases. On the back part of the thyroid gland, so we are looking at the posterior, usually there's going to be four small masses. It's two to six, and some people actually have small little clusters elsewhere. But parathyroid glands make parathyroid hormone. Parathyroid hormone increases blood calcium levels. So these are antagonistic, this is an antagonistic pair. So calcitonin decreases blood calcium levels. Parathyroid hormone increases blood calcium levels. By far the most important in controlling blood calcium levels is parathyroid hormone. And it's going to be controlled through negative feedback. So let's take a look. All right, so this is humoral stimulus. So when blood calcium levels are low, we are going to get a release of parathyroid hormone from the parathyroid glands. It's going to go into the bloodstream, and there is a three-pronged effect to raise blood calcium levels. The bones serve as calcium warehouse. So we're going to get a inhibition of osteoblasts. Those are the bone builders, and a stimulus of osteoclasts. So osteoclasts are those bone crushers. So we get bone calcium reabsorption. So calcium is going to go into the bloodstream to restore calcium levels. Also, it's going to have an effect on the kidneys. And the kidneys, remember, filter blood and make urine. So it basically tells the kidneys that there's any calcium in the urine. Make sure we reabsorb it and it goes into the bloodstream. The other thing, there's an effect uh, on calcitriol in the intestines, and we're going to get a stimulus of the intestines to absorb more calcium. So these three things, so effect on bone, kidneys, and the intestines, parathyroid hormone raises blood calcium levels. If blood calcium levels are high, then we get a release of calcitonin. You can remember calcitonin tones your bones. And so this is going to stimulate osteoblasts, and so we're going to get bone deposition. So we're going to get calcium deposition, and so we'll store that for later. It also tells the kidneys, go ahead, we don't need that calcium, go ahead and urinate it out. We don't need to reabsorb it. Once again, being honest, it's not a big player in adulthood. Case in point, when someone has their thyroid gland removed, they don't need to take supplemental calcitonin. So just kind of, it's, it's not a big player. It can be given therapeutically for uh, bone diseases. So homeostatic imbalances. If somebody's parathyroid gland is making too much parathyroid hormone, so hyperparathyroidism, that means they're going to have too much calcium in the blood. So hyper above calci calcium emia in the blood. Calcium is going to have an effect on both neurons and muscle cells. And so what it's going to do is it's going to drive the resting membrane potential further away from thresholds. I don't know if you remember, once something hits threshold, we're going to get depolarization, repolarization. We're going to get an action potential or muscle contraction. Basically, it makes things less excitable. So someone with hypercalcemia or hyperparathyroidism, if muscles are less excitable, if you think about it, then someone can have muscle weakness. If the neurons are less excitable, confusion, feeling tired, so lethargy. I've kind of given you this, if you can kind of remember the thumbs up, thumbs down thing. If calcium is high, that means neurons and muscles are less responsive, so they're opposite. So hypoparathyroidism, that is the number, remember parathyroid hormone, number one in raising blood calcium levels. So now someone has low calcemia, so keep your thumb down. So that means now we are going to be a little bit closer to threshold, so put your thumb up, so things would be more excitable. What it actually does is it makes sodium channels unstable, um, but the big thing is cells are going to depolarize more easily. So how this is going to look um, as far as neurons, you could have neural excitability. So someone may feel uh, tingling sensations, so maybe lips, 
um, their fingers, their toes, the neural excitability. You can also get uh, muscle twitches, muscle spasms, all the way up to tetany, which is that sustained muscle contraction, all the way to convulsions. If someone, we're gonna learn next chapter, that calcium is required for blood clotting, you may also see bruising in your patients with hypocalcemia. So just kind of remember your thumbs up, thumbs down thing. So hypoparathyroidism, low calcium, everything is more excitable. So muscles and neurons are more excitable. Okay, I'm gonna see how you do. What effect would hyperparathyroidism have on a skeletal system? Well, hopefully you got that. So this is an x-ray of someone with hyperparathyroidism and notice that their bones have a moth-eaten appearance. Also, what we're gonna learn later in the semester is when there is high calcium, that can also lead to high calcium in that pre-urine filtrate, and then you can also get kidney stones because most kidney stones are made up of calcium salts. All right, so let's go ahead and color the thyroid gland. So right here, the anterior neck, just below that thyroid cartilage, is the number one hormones for metabolism. It raises that basal metabolic rate. So the body's gonna use more oxygen, burn energy, and make heat, which is that calorigenic effect. Special things, these hormones require iodine. These hormones are lipid soluble. The thyroid gland stores two to three months worth. If you have too much thyroid hormone, it's called Graves' disease. Too little in adulthood, it's called myxedema. Uh, number one cause is Hashimoto's. Cretinism is that congenital hypothyroidism as a child. You can get goiters that enlarge thyroid gland with either a hyposecretion or hypersecretion. The thyroid gland also makes calcitonin, which lowers blood calcium levels. So hopefully you got all that. On the back side over here, so just color these four small masses. It makes parathyroid glands make parathyroid hormone, which is the number one regulator of calcium levels in the blood. Parathyroid hormone raises blood calcium. It does it by a three-pronged approach. It um, decreases bone, so it causes those osteoclasts, those bone crushers for bone reabsorption. So it adds calcium to the blood from the bones. Increased absorption from the diet, so calcitriol, it decreases loss in the urine. If someone has hypoparathyroidism, they're going to have hypocalcemia. So your thumb should be down, so that increases neuromuscular excitability. You can see tetany, spasms, you may also see bruising. Hyperparathyroidism, thumb up. Hypercalcemia, so decrease in neuromuscular excitability. You can also see kidney stones and fractures. Okay, this is a great place to take a break. Come back for part three.